my God. So look what Paul says now to, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. He's speaking to God-fearers in the uh, uh, village of Philippi, right? He said, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of the Messiah. What do you mean worthy of the gospel of the Messiah? The gospel that the Messiah gave me to preach to you, which is remain as a Gentile, but put your trust in the Messiah. Don't try to convert. Are you beginning to understand what Paul is saying now? So that whether I come or see you or remain, I will hear that you are standing firm in, this, in one spirit, with one mind, striving together in the faith of the gospel. You're striving to keep that gospel. What's this? In no way alarmed by your opponents. Who would be their opponents? Those who are forcing them to convert. Those are the opponents. They are the influencers, right? Which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. And that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Messiah's sake. Notice, not only to believe in him, to rely upon him, to rely upon his faithfulness, but also to suffer for his sake. What does it mean to suffer for Messiah's sake, to a God-fearer? It means that you're being pressured to convert and you're not converting. You are relying only on the Messiah. And the Jewish brethren is forcing you to convert. And your Gentile pagan family is forcing you to come back into paganism. Are you understanding the suffering that was going on to the God-fearers in, in Philippi? They were suffering for Messiah's sake because they said, I and my hope is built on nothing less. But Yeshua's blood and righteousness, that's what he's saying. I'm relying on the Messiah and I'm obeying the Torah that applies to me. That's what Paul is saying. So as we continue on, I want us to see again this pressure that was happening, right? Go with me to Galatians chapter 2. Back to Galatians chapter 2. I want you to, you may not have understood the pressure before, but now you begin to understand. And even Peter, even though God used him to open up this to the Gentiles, even he had a difficult a, a, a struggle with accepting the Gentiles as Gentiles, even though God opened his eyes and receive Cornelius and don't call them uncommon and unclean. Receive them as a Gentile because remember God went to the God-fearer. He was a God-fearer. He didn't convert. Oh my God. Watch this now in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Cephas, that's Peter, I came to Antioch, I, Paul, I opposed him to his face because he stood to be condemned. How is Paul opposing Peter? Oh, my God. For prior to coming of certain men from James, I remember James is the, is the rabbi, the chief rabbi in Jerusalem. That's the Jewish part, all right? He used to eat with the Gentiles. Paul, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof. Fearing the party of the circumcision. You see what's happening here? Are you seeing the deceitfulness? Are you seeing the struggle? Before the people came, Peter sat down and ate with the Gentiles. It doesn't mean that he had, had, had a ham sandwich. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that he ate with them. Because in the Jewish mind, it is you don't fellowship and eat with, 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 with pagan Gentiles. right? So he understood Paul's gospel. But when the circumcision came and they saw him eating, now he withdraw. You begin to see what's happening? So Paul challenged him. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by this hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward, they were not in step about the truth of the gospel. Oh my God, God is wanting to give us the truth of the gospel. I said to Peter in the presence of all, if you being a Jew, live like the Gentiles. In other words, you accept them into the fellowship and not like the Jews who said that you have to become Jewish. How is it that you are forcing these Gentiles to become Jewish? How is he forcing them? By saying, I can't eat with you unless you become Jewish. Are you seeing what's happening in the chief apostle? Because the issue was about you only enter the club if you become Jewish. And that's the error that Paul is calling out. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Help us to begin to see this, right? So what was Paul's big insight? What was this revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul? Simply, stay as a God-fearer. That's his gospel. Stay as your call as a Gentile. Stay as a Gentile. Stay as a God-fearer. Gentiles can be justified by the Messiah. Messiah, is, his blood, his, his righteousness is adequate to declare the Gentile not guilty, to legally exonerate. Stay as a Gentile without putting your trust in, in any Jewish identity. Now, this is a different perspective on Paul, brethren. 
I submit us this is a completely different perspective on the Apostle Paul. All right? So it turns out that Paul is saying, listen, he's saying there is a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. That's what he said. There is a distinction in being Jewish and being Gentile. And my gospel, because remember, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. He's saying to the Gentiles, stay as a Gentile. Don't be pressured to convert. Don't become Jewish. Because if you do, you're putting confidence on, your, on Jewish identity and not on the Messiah. And he's saying to you, you can't continue going to pagan worship. So you see, you in no man's land. <laughs> Imagine you are God fearing that day. The Jewish people pressuring you to convert so that you could be in the club and your Gentile family saying, come back and let's go bow down to idol. And Paul is saying, you can't do either. Stay as you are, remain in your calling. Are you beginning to understand the pressure? Are you beginning to understand what God is saying? So look with me now to the book of Galatians chapter 2 when Paul said this. Galatians chapter 2. Paul is a mystic. And he's always internalizing the Torah. And I want you to see that he's always internalizing his theology. You and I must be mystical too. We must internalize our theology. Can't just stay in the realm of head knowledge. It has to become revelation that transforms us. Look what he says now. For I have been crucified with the Messiah. This is Rav Shul speaking. I have been crucified with, with, with the Messiah. And it's no longer I who live, but Hamashiach lives in me. Glory to God. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Oh, my God. Now, many people have read that. Many, many persons have read that scripture and would have been tremendously blessed and continue to be blessed. If you don't have this revelation that God has given to you, you could be tremendously blessed. But let's drill down deeper and let's see what Paul is saying to us. Notice the context of Galatians. He's addressing an error. So what is he saying to them? Listen, I have been crucified with the Messiah. I died on that cross when he died. And it's no longer I who live. Mm. No longer. Look at that capital I. Now this is a Midrash here. The capital I, the ego I, must become the little I. That, that's a revelation by itself. The I, capital I, I no longer live. That little I becomes... The little eye, that, that big eye becomes the little eye in the word Christ. That's just a little way to show us that we are now in Christ and not relying on our own self. We're not justifying, or, or relying on our own self to be justified. He said, the life that I now live, I now live in the flesh. But what life is he living in the flesh? He's not talking about being an immoral. He's saying, I'm now living in the flesh, relying on the faithfulness of the Messiah and not relying on my Jewish identity, which is what he did before. Are you beginning to see what's happening here now? The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God, who loved me as a Jew died for me so that I don't rely on my Jewishness, but on his Jewishness. I rely on what he did. He exonerates me. I go home legally exonerated. I don't rely on my Jewish identity. I don't trust in my own. Are you beginning to see, beloved, what God is saying to you and I? What the argument is about, what the error he's exposed and what he's showing to us? Oh my God, what has been misunderstood for 1,800 years? We misunderstood Paul, but as we continue... I want you to begin to internalize this because every thought now, every action that you and I do should be measured by the Mashiach because the Mashiach lives in me. So what is he saying to you and I? Don't rely on your ethnic status. Don't rely on your riches. Don't rely on your, on your culture. Don't rely on anything else. All of that is sinking sand. Rely only on the Messiah. That's what he's saying. That is what Paul came to understand. I'm not relying on my Jewishness, on my Jewish identity. I'm relying on the Messiah. And he's telling the Galatians, the god fearers don't rely on converting to Judaism. Rely on the Messiah. Internalize this theology. Don't try to become Jewish. Because if you do that, then you're relying on your Jewish identity. So look what he said in, 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 in verse 19. I said Paul could be hard to understand. Look at verse 19. For through the law, I die to the law so that I may live to God. Now that is a, like, a, a, that is confusing. Anybody read that? What do you mean? Through the law, I die to the law. Now people take that to mean all kinds of things. But can I submit to you? 
through a revelation of the Torah that Yeshua's faithfulness is what I should rely on. I die to being Jewish. I die to Jewish identity. Have you seen it? In the first one law meant revelation that he got by the Spirit through the Torah. The second word law meant now his Jewish identity. So what he's saying, I died. I, when Messiah died on the cross, I died to put in my confidence in Jewish identity. And until that happens to you and I, we would still be relying on our strength, our, wishes, our, our riches, and our wisdom. And that's the, that's the challenge that we have. Don't boast in your riches. Don't boast in your wisdom. Don't boast in your strength. Boast in the Messiah. That's what Paul is saying, and that's what you and I need to internalize. Oh, my God. So we continue on, right? So he's saying that to us. So what happened in, in, in this road to Damascus? Did he convert from Judaism to Christianity? No. What happened was he was no longer Torah-centric. He became Christocentric. He was no longer relying on the Torah and Jewish identity. He was not relying on the Messiah. That is what happened. So we don't talk about Paul's conversion. We talk about Paul's transformation. He was off-center. Now he was on point. That's what happened to Paul, and that's what you that what, what needs to happen to you and I, right? So go with me to the same Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Watch this. This is Paul. Remember, he's speaking to his, uh, uh, his disciples, God-fearers. Remember, he sowed the gospel among them, and he's telling them, remain as a Gentile. But when he left, some influencers, some people came in and disturbed them and tell them they have to become Jewish. Now, look what he says now. Chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians. Now, this is strong language here. You fool, said in our vernacular, you idiots, who has brainwashed you? You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Yeshua the Messiah has been publicly portrayed and crucified. So what he's saying to his beloved brethren, he said, listen, you have been bewitched. Now, long ago, there was a movie called Bewitched. And I used to love to watch that until I found out that that is contrary to Torah. And I love it, but I had to give it up because that is just contrary to Torah, right? But the principle is that bewitched means under a spell. So he's saying, Galatians, you have been put under a spell. You have been bewitched. And you are also being a bewitcher. So question to you, are you bewitched? And are you acting as a bewitcher? Because there are things that you could be running well with, and then suddenly you put on that spell, and then you, you, you can't even think straight. You're thinking like an idiot. You're a foolish Galatian. You have shift focus now to rely upon conversion rather than on Messiah. And Paul says you are bewitched. You are on that spell. Who is behind that? The father of lies. And you and I need to ask ourselves that today, brethren, I submit to you what's happening here, brethren. Who bewitched? Conventional, traditional Christianity. To understand that Paul is talking about cast away Jewishness, cast away Torah obedience. Don't rely on the works of the law because works of the law mean obedience. There's a bewitching that took place for 1800 years. And God is now rebuking the father of lies. The Lord rebuke you, Hasatan, the father of lies. And revelation is coming because God said, I'm going to send you to open their eyes. That they will turn from Hasatan to God. Their eyes open from light, from darkness to light. And you can love the Lord and confess his name and still be in darkness. Your darkened understanding that works of the Lord mean uh, uh, um, um, Torah obedience. You, you throw the baby with the bathwater. Paul is saying, don't keep the Shabbat. Don't eat kosher. Paul is saying, all those things. All you have to do is trust in Christ. And that's a powerful truth. The, the thief on the cross trusted in Christ. Baruch Hashem. And he died with Christ. But you and I now are not dying with Christ in that sense. We are off that cross and now we are living. We are becoming a living sacrifice. Because we are dying to ourselves, now obeying him and not relying on ourselves. Are you seeing what God is saying? Okay, Baruch Hashem. So, who bewitched you and who are you bewitching oh my god so i submit to you again that the second category the second category that's the proselytes those gentiles who converted to judaism they are possibly the influences there may be some jewish people among them eh? but i submit to you that there it, it was the influences those who are in category 
two who converted, who jumped through the conversion loop, was pressuring the God-fearers to be circumcised. In other words, they say, listen, we got this by jumping through the conversion loop. You, Jesus is good, right? But I want you to know he's not good enough. You need to also convert. Are you beginning to see what's happening here? The proselytes say, listen, we became Jewish by conversion. Now we're receiving this message of Yeshua. You also have to believe in Yeshua and also become Jewish. And they were pressuring them. And Paul said to them, don't yield to that lie. That's a lie. But influencers, bewitchers, they, 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 it's a religious spirit. So they go to the Torah. They, they, they imagine, they, they say, okay, you, you, you're thinking that you don't need to be circumcised? Let's go with me. Go with me to Exodus chapter 12. Go with me today. Because you see, they're trying to prove the point, right? So you, you, say, you pull out the Torah. The Torah says this. Now you're a Torah terrorist, right? You are a religious person and you are influenced. You're bewitched, but you don't know you're bewitched. You're sincere, but sincerely wrong, right? And you say, open your Bible. Go with me to Exodus chapter 12, right? And in Exodus chapter 12, read this. If a stranger, verse 48, if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then let him come near and celebrate it. He shall be like the native of the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat of it. The same law shall apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns with you. Look at there. The Bible say that you have Gentiles, you're, you're stranger, you have to be circumcised. And they, 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 they work that puppy. They really bring that home to you. And you say, yeah, really? Look at there. And you are bewitched. So they say, no, that's not good enough. Let's go to Genesis chapter 17. Go to Genesis chapter 17. I want to, really want to make this point to you. So Genesis chapter 17, we go. And we read this. Verse 10. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you. Right? Genesis 17 verse 10. Uh, uh, you and your descendants after you. Every male. Among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. So it's not just a spiritual thing. I'm telling you, you have to be physically circumcised. Right? And it shall be the sign in the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight years old shall be circumcised throughout your generation. A servant who is born in your house or bought with money or any foreigner, notice foreigner, they have to be circumcised. A servant who is born in your house and who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. You uh, 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 and thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But every uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from the people he has broken my covenant. Look at there. And the influencers now pressure. Are you begin to see the influencers are using the Torah, using their understanding of the, to pressure these god fearers to be circumcised. Pressuring them to say, listen, you have to become Jewish. Jesus is good, but not good enough. And so you have, they're putting you under a spell. And you're not under the spell. You can't think for yourself. You have an open head, but your brains fall out. You want to need to have an open, o, o, open mind, but don't, don't let your brains fall out. You got to think the thing through. What is Paul saying? What, this is hard to understand. You, you're pressing me. You're pressing me. What is this about? What, what is this about? All right? And so you begin to see what Paul is saying to and said, oh, my God. One law for all. Look at there. One law for all. And I read this. I said, God, show me what you show Paul. Because I am reading the same thing. And it seems to me that you're saying the people of Israel have to be circumcised. And the Gentiles have to be circumcised. So you got to show me what Paul saw. Because you're telling me that Paul is seeing something that other people are not seeing. So what is it Paul is seeing? How is he telling the god fearers don't be circumcised, don't become Jews, when right here the Torah is telling us one law of everybody. What's happening here, God? Show me this thing. And of course, you know, Genesis 50, like, like, uh, he believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteous. Paul is reading that. And then Genesis 17, the seal of circumcision given. You see that in Romans 4. So he believed God, uncircumcised. And then 15 years later, he's given the seal of circumcision. So circumcision was an outworking, a sign of what he already believed. It was faith working out that salvation. So Paul got this big insight. You're telling me that the Gentiles have to be circumcised to enter the club of Israel? But look, Abraham was uncircumcised and he, he believed and was reckoned he was righteousness. And that's Paul's key text. He believed and he wasn't circumcised. You know, he believed and he didn't rely on anything. 
He relied on God who called him. And later on, he also was circumcised. And Paul said, that is to show that he's the father of the uncircumcised and the circumcised. Because both groups, Jew and Gentile, need to follow in the footsteps of Abraham. Look at Romans chapter 4. You would see what he's saying. So this is what Paul got. And so I looked at this and I said, God, you need to give me something from Genesis 17. I want you to show me something from Genesis 17 that shows me the, the, the gospel that you gave your servant for. And I read Genesis 17 over and over again. I said, Lord, it seems to be saying this. And I read it again, I read it again, I read it again until the spell was broken. And I've no longer bewitched, thanks be to God, by the understanding that everybody, one law for all. Look with me, if you will. Genesis 17, verse 4. Watch this. As for me, as for me, that's the key thing that jumped out of me. As for me. So God is saying, as for me. Behold, now when you see that word behold, God is about to drop a powerful revelation upon you. This is awesome. He's setting you up for something. This is something that's happening here that you can't see in your intellect. You have to see by this word. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. Hmm. And remember, you there, you were uncircumcised. You will be the father of a multitude of nations. Oh my God. It was a boom. Like what? What, what do you mean? Boom. You will be a father of a multitude of nations, even while you are uncircumcised. As for me, I am about to do something. I am about to do something that you will miss. What is it I'm about to do? I'm about to call into being that which does not exist. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. God is about to give a revelation that he's going to call a category into existence that doesn't exist. You will be a father of a multitude of nations. And they're going to be nations. You're not going to be a father of, of the nation. You're going to be a father of a multitude of nations. As for me, I'm going to do this. Now watch this. Watch adverse, adverse, uh, uh, adverse. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is my father. No, verse 9. Elohim said to Abraham, now as for you. Now what's the difference? As for me. As for you. So God is saying, I'm doing this one for my own namesake. But I'm going to allow you to do this for your namesake. Are you beginning to see the difference? Now jump across with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 4. Because you've got to see this. A miracle just took place there. And it may have we're flown straight over your head. We're going to come back and bring it to us again. A miracle took place there. But that was spirit and revelation. And if you didn't get it, my, my, my God, we're coming again that, that you will get it. Look at me. Revelation chapter 4, verse uh, 16. No, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 4, verse 16. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 4, verse 16. For this reason, it is by faith. Remember the faithfulness of the Messiah? In order that it might be accordant with grace. By grace of we say. So that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants. Not only to those who are of the law. Now you understand. To those who are Jewish. But also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. Hmm. Who is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. But before he made him that, he called him a father. Are you seeing the difference? He called him a father of multitudes before he made him a father of nations. I have made you in the presence of him who believed God, who what? Gives life to the dead. That's given life to Abraham's uh, reproductive organs and Sarah's reproductive organs and cause into being that which does not exist. What is he calling into being? Isaac. What is he calling into being? A multitude of nations that don't need to be Jewish to access the faithfulness of the Messiah. Are you seeing this, beloved? Oh my God. Oh my God. I, I pray God that we would see it again and again and again as we continue into it, right? So go with me now to Galatians chapter 6 so again. God is showing, as for me, behold, I will do this. I'm calling to being that which does not exist. A multitude of nations who remain uncircumcised, you will be their father, and they will walk in your footsteps, relying on the seed of Abraham, who is the Messiah, and not relying on becoming Jewish. Glory to God! And you, if you're part of the nations, that's what you would have done. And if you're trying to be Jewish, then you're no longer relying on the faithfulness of the Messiah. You're relying on being Jewish. That's the error. So go with me to Galatians chapter 6. 
Galatians chapter 6, verse 13. Galatians chapter 6, verse 13. Oh Lord, help us as we continue on. Galatians chapter 6, verse 13 says, For those who are circumcised, that is, become Jewish, they do not even keep the Torah themselves. Notice, they're fortunate to become Jewish, but they're not really because they miss the intent of the Torah. All right? But they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. They boast that they get you to be Jewish. They boast that I get you to join the club. I boast that I force you and pressure you and you gave it. You cave in. I boast in your flesh. Are you understanding? They're boasting in their flesh. But may it never we continue on. Uh, uh, where, 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 where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Verse 12, did I say where? Verse 13. For those who are circumcised, do not keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But then he said, But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of the Messiah, Yeshua Messiah, through which the world has been crucified to me. The world has been, has the world been crucified to you? Or are there things in the world that you rely on for standing before God and before men? Has the world been crucified to you? And have you been crucified to the world? Or is there something in the world that you are relying on? I rely on my strength. I rely on my looks. I'm relying on my money. I'm relying. I, don't you dare talk to me like that. Because what? You're relying on yourself. What going on? All right. But he said, he asked this. He says, listen. Verse 15. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Paul, what do you mean? Neither is being Jewish anything nor being Gentile. What really matters is a new creation. Now that, brethren, is a revelation from God himself to the body of Messiah. What Paul is saying, Jewish identity is nothing. Gentile identity is nothing. Not that he's dismissing it. What he's saying, don't rely upon it for salvation. That's the point he's making. What really matters is a new creation. But what do you mean new creation? Oh my God. God opened my eyes to understand new creation. Go with me to Genesis. And I, as you go there, Genesis chapter 3, I ask you, what is the new creation that God made after he had completed the heavens and the earth? What was the new creation that he made? After he completed the heavens and the earth, there was a new creation that he made. What is it? While you're thinking and coming up with all your answers, I just want to submit to you verse chapter three, Galatians chapter three, verse 20. Now the man called his wife's name Eve, Hava, because she was the mother of all living. She is the mother of all living. Keep that in mind. Hava, Eve is the mother of all living. But I ask you, what was the new creation? I submit to you. The new creation was Eve. After making the heavens and the earth, in Genesis 1, we see he made a male and female. But in Genesis 2, we see how God put Adam to sleep and brought forth Eve. Not from his rib, but from his side. I say, he's made from rib. No, no, you're not made from his rib. You're made from his side. All right. So she was the new creation. Are you seeing it? Eve is the new creation. Eve is a new creation. After making heaven and the earth, the new creation that he made in the earth is Eve. Hmm. So when you begin to consider now, Paul is saying, Jewish identity is nothing, Gentile identity is nothing, but a new creation. Well, Eve is a female. For a female, physical circumcision is irrelevant. Being uncircumcised is irrelevant. For a female, that doesn't Come on the radar screen. All right? So what is important? The new creation. Identifying yourself now as a new creation. And what was Eve to Adam? This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Oh, my God. When God opened my eyes, I, I, I couldn't keep still. I was so excited. I, I said, oh, my God, this is wonderful. Because immediately, the Spirit helped me to understand the Kesha. First Adam, last Adam. Hmm. First Eve, last Eve. So who is Eve? Eve is symbolic of the body of Messiah. If there's a last Adam, there is a last Eve. And how did this last Eve form? 
Yeshua the Messiah, oh my God, blessed is he, was put to death, put to sleep, oh God, on the cross. And when in his deep sleep, he died, oh my God, for you and I, so that I could rely upon him alone. And a, a, a soldier came and pierced his side, and out of his side came blood and water, a female blood and water. You understand that? He's thinking out of his side, this new creation was made and brought him to the last Adam. And see, and this, this last Adam is saying, now here is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Oh my God, brethren, are you seeing who we are? We are the last Eve. We ought to be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, which means that we are one with him. Which means that we live and move and have all been because he brought us into being. Are you seeing this, brother? It has nothing to do with relying upon, upon, upon your ethnicity. It has to do with now becoming a child of God. So what happens? You and I, the father makes us sons and daughters. So the father gets children. The lamb gets a wife, and the spirit gets a habitation. So the Godhead have all their needs met, as it were. The father gets sons and daughters. The lamb gets a wife, the last Eve, and the spirit gets a house, a habitation. And that's who we are. So you and I need to remember we are born of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And we must yield to the last Adam because we are the last Eve. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. This is so powerful, brethren, that God wants us to begin to see these things. And he's saying to us, don't rely on your understanding. Don't try to convert to Judaism. All right? This is what Paul is making. Now, in, in Galatians, I want to go back to this quickly. In the book of Galatians, he told us something about the Mashiach. All right? He said the Mashiach is the seed of Abraham. Now, where did we get that? Go with me to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22. Because this is so powerful. Genesis 22. Genesis 22. You know the account, the Akira, right? The binding of Isaac, right? Genesis 22. We don't take time to go through it. We would have thought on this before. But we're going to look at verse 18 again. Watch this. Verse 18. Genesis 22, verse 18. After Abraham would have proved himself faithful to God. Relying on God alone. God called him. He said, Hinini, here I am. All right? God called him. Remember, look at verse 8. He said, in your seed. Not seeds, plural, but in your seed. And we know who that seed is. Yeshua HaMashiach. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Oh, my God. All the nations will be blessed. How? The nation of Israel will be blessed. By give, being given the gospel of circumcision, the nations of the world will be blessed by remaining uncircumcised in flesh, all right, but circumcised in heart and encountering the Messiah. How are the nations the world blessed? All Jew and Gentile rely on the Mashiach. How do we know this? Look at this. All the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And verse 19, so Abraham turned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Did you miss something? Did you miss Isaac? Abraham and Isaac went up. But when they came down, it said, Abraham returned to his young men. Where's Isaac? Mystical. Abraham and Isaac became one. That's what's happened when you identify with the purpose and goal of King Messiah. You the Father and the Son becomes one. That's what God wants to do with you and I. He wants us to become one. It's like Isaac, it, 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 he's a part, he, he, he's, he's wrapped up in the Father. So you don't see Isaac, you see the Father. Oh my God, this is what God is saying. And God is pressuring you and I, not pressuring, my matter of fact, giving us an opportunity to become such a son. He's given us that choice to become such a son as Isaac. And Isaac was such a son. You know, we tend to focus on, on Abraham. He's such so wonderful. But I want you to think about Isaac. He was about 37 years old. He was not a little child. He knew exactly what was playing out. And the Midrash said, he said to his father, Father, I recognize I'm going to be the sacrifice. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to bind me so tightly that I don't flinch when you come to slit my throat. He was so identified with the will of the father. The Midrash that I always love to, to, to show us is this. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, he said, 
he came, the father came to Abraham and he said to him, take now your son. Take now your son. So Abraham said, I have two sons. Which one? I have a, 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 two, two, two sons. So which one? He said, your only son. He said, Abraham said, well, Ishmael is the only son of, of Hagar and Isaac is the only son of Sarah. So which one are you talking about? He said, the one you love. He said, well, I love both of them. I love Ishmael and I love Isaac. So which one? God tells him, Isaac. Now, that is a fanciful way of showing you how God brought it to him, right? It's not there explicitly. You have to draw it out. But he's telling you, take Isaac because the covenant is with Isaac. Oh, my God. This is so powerful because God is wanting us to understand this. Now, I want you to see the connection. I'm going to just give some brief connection. Don't try to write it down. This is a lot. But I just want you to see the connection between Isaac and Yeshua, right? Let's just listen to it. Isaac, the image of the father Abraham. Yeshua, he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Isaac was the promised son of the covenant with Abraham. Yeshua was the promised son of the covenant with Abraham and David. Isaac, miraculous conception. Yeshua, miraculous conception. Isaac, willingly complied. Yeshua, willingly complied. Isaac was 36 or 37 years old. Yeshua was approximately uh, 30 or 36 years old. All right? Um, yeah, Isaac was tempted by Satan. Yeshua was tempted by Satan. Satan attempted to stop the sacrifice. This is Midrash here. Satan attempted to stop the sacrifice, stop the cru crucifixion. So if you, you look, there are so many parallels between Isaac and Yeshua. Isaac was bruised on his wrist and ankles by the ropes. Yeshua was scarred on his wrist and ankles by the nails. In other words, there are many parallels between Isaac and Yeshua. And a lesson for us that you and I need to grasp is this. In, the, in Genesis chapter 22, there are three words that I use the first time. Love, worship, and obey. Those three words I use the first time in Genesis 22. And what God is saying if you want to understand what love is, read Genesis 22. You want to understand what worship is, read Genesis 22. You want to understand what obey is, read Genesis 22. So when you talk about worship team, worship him, worship him, worship him. No, no, no. We confuse these terms. You praise him. Praise is of, of the flesh as it were, the hands. Worship is of the spirit. I seek those who would worship me in spirit. All right? And worship is ultimate submission to the will of God. And that's what Abraham did on Mount Moriah. He submitted himself to the will of God. Are you a worshiper of God? Not that you worship him by saying, Lord, I love you. That's praising him. You worship him when, you, when he tells you, lift your hands and you don't feel to do it. Now you're worshiping him. When he tells you, go and give forgiveness and you don't feel to do it. Now you're worshiping him. You could praise him from now until, but not worship him. But in Abraham, if you love him, keep my commandments, you would worship me and you'd find yourself obeying him because... If you love me, keep my commandments, which is what Abraham did. Take your son. If we truly love him, we will obey him. And that's what God is saying. You and I need to recognize that we are, we are being cloned from Abraham's spiritual DNA. That's what's happening. And we're going to get into that a little later. Okay? But look with me. One other text I want to give us quickly. Go with me to Galatians chapter 4. Again, Paul is trying to make this point, right? Now in Galatians chapter 4, we have an encounter here. Verse 21. All right? Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. I want to, to, to point this out to us because, again, this, this is something that is grossly misunderstood. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law. Now you understand. He's talking to God, Pharaoh. You who want to become Jewish, Christianity, you who want to keep the Shabbat. You see the gross error? Christianity is saying, Paul is saying, you want to keep Shabbat, you want to be under the law, so they give you this now. Watch this. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, but now you have knowledge, so you can begin to acknowledge this. No, you who want to be Jewish, do you not listen to what the Torah says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bond woman and one by the free woman. For the son of the bond woman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman through the promise. This is a lot allegorically speaking for those are women two women two covenants one proceeding from mount sinai bearing children who are to be slaves she is eager so if you keep any torah you are slave. you are in bondage 
Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia that corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Right? Baruch Hashem. You see what's going on here? Verse 28. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of the promise. Paul is telling them, listen, you already rely on the Messiah. You're already children of promise. But now at that time, he who was born um, to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. But what did the scripture say? Cast out the born woman. Oh, cast out the born woman and her son. And the son, for the son uh, 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 of the born woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the born woman. We don't have to keep Shabbat and eat kosher and do all those things. We are free. We could eat what we want, do what we want. We could assemble with everything. We are free. How has this been translated? Judaism is Hagar, Jerusalem below. Ishmael is Jews in slavery. Remember, look at the picture. This is how Christianity thinks, right? Christianity is Sarah. And Isaac is free Christian. Oh my God. So that's how we parcel this thing out. To show witness. We are Sarah. And if you're trying to keep the Torah, you're under bondage. We are free. We miss it the boat completely. Because Paul, I submit to you, was talking hmm, to the God fearers to not become Jewish. So the passage is he's, he, 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 he's contrasting two types of proselytes. Hmm. The legal proselyte and the spiritual proselyte. What is the legal proselyte? The one who jumped through the loop of conversion. Gentile, give up all Gentile, you become Jewish. The spiritual proselyte is you become a son and daughter of Abraham without actually converting. And what Paul is saying to us, the, the one becomes part of Abraham's family by the conventional conversion. Which one do you think that is? The other true faith in the Messiah. Which one you think that is? Hmm. So this passage is not contrasting Old Testament versus New Testament. It is not contrasting Old Covenant and New Covenant. It is not contrasting Judaism and Torah. It's not contrasting Jews against Christians. It's not about that. It means that if you are a Jewish believer, you should be proud of being Jewish because you are a child of Abraham legally physically and spiritually and it means that if you are a gentile believer you too are part of abraham's family you are a child of promise but if you're trying to convert then you're being like hagar if you remain uncircumcised and and be a gentile then you are a child of sarah according to the promise not relying on flesh oh my god i hope that that is that is clearer for us to begin to see what god is saying to us now we bring in this home but go with me to ephesians chapter 2 ephesians chapter 2 book of ephesians chapter 2 i want to give that this passage remember paul is speaking to gentiles ephesians chapter 2 verse 15 ephesians 2 verse 15 by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, establishing peace. And normal Christianity, read that. The law of commandments is done away. The Torah is abolished. We are now free in Jesus. That's what we are preaching. And if you even look in the direction of Torah, you are in slavery. You are under bondage. Is that what Paul is saying? No, beloved. He's not equating a, a Torah obedience with becoming Jewish. His, his argument is don't become Jewish. But put your trust in the Messiah and obey the commandment that applies to you. So now let's reread this. Abolishing in his flesh the enmity. Notice what he abolished. Not the Torah, but the enmity. There's an envy and an enmity between Jew and Gentile. The law of commandments, works of the law, contained in ordinances. Now that word ordinances is dogma. It is, a, it is word dogma from which we get the word dogmatic. So what Paul is saying, there is a dogmatic teaching that is an error that says you have to convert. And that puts hostility. And that hostility was there in the days of Paul and is now in our days. Because in the days of Paul, the Jewish people wanted the Gentiles to convert. And once you convert, then you have no enmity. But today, the church has gone a whole 
swing the pendulum the next way. The Jews now are endangered species. The Jews have to convert and become Gentiles. So in the days of Paul, the Gentiles were being challenged and forced to convert to become Jewish. Today, the Jewish person is being forced to convert to become Gentile. Why? Because Paul said that the law is bondage and you have to give up that bondage and become saved. You see what's happening now? Mm -hmm.